I was, I was joking, whoa, you know. I was joking with all those that were taller than me, saying, if you're taller than me, you can't get on stage, but uh, there are four or five of them about in that category. On September the 5th, 1977, Voyager 1 was launched into space. 1977, so it's been, been out there a long time. Its mission to take up-close pictures of Saturn, of Jupiter, and their moons. So you can see these men there, they're programming this uh, space vessel that's going to go and take pictures. Voyager 1, then this next picture, it was put inside at the top part of the Titan rocket. It was launched on September the 5th, 1977. And this diagram here shows that it was there in the, in the front. It was a successful launch, sent out into space and on its way towards Saturn and Jupiter. There actually is a website you can go to. This is people that don't have anything else to do but look around the internet. But this actually has an elapsed time that, that's going on. You can go on to uh, the internet and you can see this elapsed time in motion as it goes and talks about and, and shows how far it is, how far it's gone, its distance from the earth. If you look right now, its distance from earth is 13 billion miles, million miles, billion, long way. Elapsed time, look at that 41 years it's been in space, it is a long ways away, and it's moving quickly. So I took this as a screenshot, um, go back, I took this as a screenshot on August the 9th, you can see there in red, now go to the next one. In just 24 hours, I, I took another uh, screenshot, and you can see it has gone a long, 2 million miles, it's traveled in just... 24 hours. It's moving quickly. It's moving away from us at an incredible speed. Now, in 1990, 13 years after its launch, Voyager 1 neared the outer limits of the solar system. So it's traveled, it's done its job, it's taken the pictures, and, and now it is nearing the edge of our solar system. And scientists ordered Voyager to take a photo of the Earth from 3.7 billion miles away. Now I'm about to show you a picture of what Earth looks like from 3.7 billion miles away. Be go back. Oh man, go back. Because, <laughs> because of the distance, it took five and a half hours for each bit of the photo to arrive back. Okay? The photo was possible because a beam of the sun lit up the earth, and so they ordered the vessel to take a picture. Now go to the next one. The photo was given this name, the pale blue dot. So get ready. You've already been previewed, but here it is now. There it is. Yep, that's it right there. And uh, on a better resolution, it's just blue and it's pale. And that's what... The earth looks like from four billion miles away. It's just a speck. It's like a pixel. It's just one little spot. And you might can see barely in this, there, there's a beam of light coming down from the top right, from the sun, just enough to light it up so you can see it. The pale blue dot. When presenting this information... At a speech at Cornell University in 1994, Carl Sagan said this about the pale blue dot. You see a dot, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives on that speck, the pale blue dot. All our joys and sufferings, ideologies and doctrines, Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. If you really stop to think about it, he continued, the pale blue dot is perhaps the most terrifying photograph ever taken for all humanity's illusions of importance. 
for all our delusions of grandeur, for all our great novels and amazing scientific discoveries, for all our selfies and cat photos, we're just an infinitesimally small speck. When you think of how small we are in the universe, that from a distance of four billion miles, we're just barely visible. Consider Psalm 8. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest? him considering our smallness in the universe the thought that the creator of the universe would notice me would know me and care for me is mind-boggling to think that the one who created this vast universe of which which we're just a small speck in to think that even in, in, upon that earth is the one person, the me or the you, that God would love you, know you, care for you, love you, and die for you. is pretty incredible to think about. In today's lesson, we're going to look at another event in the life of Elijah. Elijah is shaken with fear and despair, and it is an awareness of the presence of God that brings him out of that despair. It is an awareness that even he, the one person, is loved and noticed and cared for by the creator of this vast and great universe. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. Last week we considered the contest of the prophets of Baal with Elijah and how fire came down from the heaven to consume the altar of God. And Elijah then had the prophets of Baal put to death, slain. So in verse 1, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life, and when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and then lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. And so he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave and spent the night. This verse simply says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. Let's consider then these four ideas in today's lesson. First, Elijah's statement, I've had enough. We've all been in those moments, haven't we? The I have had enough moment where everything seems to have piled up, or maybe it's just a fearful moment where we say, I've had enough. Maybe it's with our kids. I've had enough of this. Whatever that moment is, we 
all can grasp the emotion of that moment. Get up and eat is our second point. A gentle whisper, the third one, and then go back the way you came. First, I've had enough. He came to a broom tree and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Now let's think about where this sits in Elijah's life. It comes off of a great spiritual high. A great victorious moment where Elijah, seemingly unafraid, stands with great boldness before the people in this great contest with the prophets of Baal. Confident, self-assured, bold in his belief in God that God is going to be victorious over these false gods. So you see here in this picture, this artist's representation of the fire coming down out of the heavens and consuming the altar and the offering and the wood and the soil and the water. This great moment then is followed by this moment. The fearful moment. The triumph over Baal is soon eclipsed by the threats of Jezebel to take Elijah's life. Jezebel was a vile woman and her threats were very real threats. Here's another children's book picture of Jezebel. I showed you one last week. They're always like this. Jezebel was a real threat for Elijah and he was afraid and he ran for his life. He was so fearful and so disappointed and felt so threatened that he was depressed. He said, I've had enough. Please, Lord, take my life. Jezebel is furious. She is not used to not getting her own way, and she vows to inflict the same fate on Elijah by the same time the following day. And so as I think about the emotions of Elijah we realize he was afraid, he was sad, and he'd had enough. I'm so thankful for this passage. Because this passage reveals to us how God brings back a man who's at a place of I've had enough, encourages him, and strengthens him back to his health. This discouragement of Elijah is something that happens to all of us. Sooner or later we may feel that all we have been and are and are trying to do is set to naught. And there's no progress. Inertia sets in and the status quo reigns. Or to say another way, say it another way, we've just had enough. I'm encouraged to think that even great men of faith have times when they are afraid. Even great people of faith are sad. Even great people of faith are depressed. And God does not abandon us in those times. And it is in those moments that it is most important that we become aware of God's abiding presence. And one of the biggest things that God does for Elijah in this depressed and sad moment is teach him to listen for his voice. In counseling, a lot of times I try to, to talk to people about the voices that they hear. And I'm not talking about like they're crazy to hear voices but just the kinds of voices that we tend to listen to. Most of the time, our minds are so filled with negative voices that that's all we hear. We hear the voices about what we can't do, about how bad we are, about the negative things in our lives, that we're, we're worthless and hopeless. And if we aren't careful, those can be the only voices that we tend to hear. And God brings to Elijah 
his still small voice that Elijah listens to and hears. And that is the voice that God wants Elijah to listen more closely for. Because there will always be negative voices in our minds. And we need to tune our ears to hear the voices that are of God. That he loves us. That he cares for us. That he made us. That we are special. And that we on that speck in the universe are so important and so precious that he would send his one and only son to that pale blue dot to die on a cross for those people that live there, and that's us. Number two, get up and eat. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat for your journey is too much for you. The tendency with depression and withdrawal and isolation is to find ourselves isolated and away from people. Not only is Elijah gripped with fear, he's sad, he's pessimistic, he's withdrawn and he's isolated. It is not surprising to me the first thing that God does to aid Elijah in his sadness is to urge him to exercise good self-care. I'm going to feed your body. I'm going to take care of the basic needs of your life first. These most important needs, the needs for your own physical survival. So I'm going to feed you and give you water to drink two times. After self-care then, after feeding him, after uh, nourishing Elijah, God directs Elijah towards the mountain of God. Elijah must stop focusing upon himself and on his own misery and focus upon God. Now I'm going to make an application for back to school on this eventually. But I want all of us to see that there are many times that we feel alone, that we feel isolated, and that we feel that God has abandoned us. And it is in those moments that it is important that we direct ourselves, refocus ourselves, back off of ourselves and our own misery, and upon God and serving other people. And that's basically this lesson. Because Elijah's filled with all these I moments. I'm the only one. I've been abandoned. There are no, there's no one else faithful but me. I've done everything right. I'm fleeing from my life. And God redirects Elijah off of himself and on to God and on to serving other people. He takes him then to a place where worship would be the most powerful. He takes him to the mountain of God. Number three, a gentle whisper. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Let's go to the map. After killing Baal's prophets, Elijah ran from the furious Queen Jezebel. He fled to Beersheba and then into the desert and finally to Mount Horeb. And there, like Moses centuries earlier, he talked with God. Most people believe that Horeb is, really, is Mount Sinai, that those mountains maybe are twin peaks or they're together. But I like to think it's the same mountain, the same place. And so God takes Elijah, back to where it all started. Back to the beginning. Let's go back to the basics. The basics for you, Elijah, are trust in God. Worship God. Focus on Him. And when you find yourself self-focused and self-pitied, the best place to go is to go and worship God. Exalt Him. Focus on Him. 
worship him. So he takes him to Horeb, the mountain of God. And it is upon Mount Horeb that Elijah enters the presence of God. But God's presence does not come in an expected form. The mountain is not like it was when Moses was there. And there was lightning and thunder and they couldn't touch the mountain. They couldn't go near it. God's presence is there, but it's different this time. Equally impressive. So let's read 1 Kings 19 now, beginning in verse 10. Read through 13. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now he's still in his I moments. He replied, I have been very jealous, uh, zealous for the Lord, the God of Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put their prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Now, of all the translations, I like in this case the King James Version the best. The still, small voice. That's beautiful. It's so much better than whisper. Almost every translation uses the word whisper. And whisper's fine. It, it translates well. It, it's a good translation. But in my mind, when I think of a whisper, it's just not the same as this still, small voice. You see, the still, small voice is something you have to pay attention to. The fire is grand. God's in those things that are powerful and grand. The earthquake is impressive, shakes the ground. It's scary if you've ever been in one. The wind is impressive. The wind that's enough to split rocks and to move things, impressive. If you've seen a tornado or seen uh, some hurricane winds, it's impressive. It's terrifying. And God could be in all of those things, but on this, in this moment, he's in this Still, small voice. Which Elijah has to listen to. He hears it. And when he hears it, he rushes out and puts his cloak over himself. God is in this still, small voice. I would like to suggest to you that We need to stop surrounding ourselves with so much noise that we fail to hear God's still, small voice. That in all the voices that seek to discourage us and bring us down, to depress us, that we need to tune our ears to hear the voice that is the still, small voice of God. Spoken to us in many wonderful and encouraging words in Scripture that build us up. Here then is some version translation. Most of them use the word whisper. The ESV says the fire, then came the sound of a low whisper. The Holman says a soft whisper. The, the living a Bible says a gentle whisper. The message says a gentle and quiet whisper. The New, uh, the New American Standard Bible does go a little bit off track from the whisper and says a gentle blowing. But you can see here, most of them use whisper, but I like the still, small voice. 
There is a verse to the song, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, that actually has many more verses than we have in our songbook. But one of the best ones they've omitted from our songbook, and it's this one, and it kind of refers to this Elijah moment where the, the still, small voice of calm is the presence of God. Breathe through the heat of, heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire. O oh, still, small voice of calm. It's beautiful. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Now listen, you children going to school. At school, if you feel alone, if you feel rejected, remember, you're never alone. God loves you and his presence goes with you. Train your ears to hear him. Number four, go back the way you came. After self-care and focusing on God, God then focuses Elijah on others. Overlooking the I statements, God moves Elijah's attention from himself and on to others. He has him to serve other people. He gives him something to do. He gives him a purpose. And it's almost as if God interrupts all of his feel sorry for himself, I am depressed moments and says, go worship me and I have some things for you to do. Get up, get out, get going, serve other people, it will help. So in verse 13, we'll read through the end of this section. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenants, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and uh, Abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death those who escaped the sword of Jehu. So here you see that immediately... God tells Elijah to serve other people, to do something. Go and anoint these people. Go and, and choose a helper, Elisha, to be your partner and to help you. So the final thing then God does to help Elijah with his I've had enough moment is to let him know he's not alone. He gives him something to do. He tells him to serve others, and then he says, oh, and by the way, you're not alone. Verse 18, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So for all your statements, I'm the only one, it's not true. There are others, 7,000, who have not kissed him, not kissed Baal. So God's answer for Elijah's I've had enough moment, self-care, focus on God, focus on others, and you are not alone. Guess what? During the length of this lesson, the Voyager has traveled 19,013 miles, if it, was, if it was 30 minutes long. Realizing our smallness in the universe keeps us humble. But knowing that the God, the creator of this vast universe, cares for us individually and loves us is also very humbling, but also very uplifting. To think that his presence goes with me. The presence of the one who created the universe. 
The one who created all things, including the pale blue dot, but the people on that pale blue dot, including me, are not unimportant to God. He is always with us. God knows when each one of us has had enough. He helped Elijah by taking care of Elijah's physical needs and then taking the focus off of himself and onto God's presence and onto others. So if you're sad today, realize God loves you. Listen for his voice. Get up. Take care of yourself. Worship him and serve others. In the end of his speech at Cornell University, Carl Sagan said, To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Let's bow for a prayer. Father, I add my voice to those today who've prayed for our children. I pray for them while they are away from their homes and at school. That they will realize that when they are at school and away from their parents, that they are not alone because your presence goes with them. And that when they feel sad and when they feel alone, they will listen for the encouraging voice that they are loved and valued, that you care for them. And that they will look for ways to worship you and to serve others. And that we also, Lord, in these moments when we have had enough, will take the time to take the focus off of ourselves to worship you and to serve others. I'm thankful, Lord, for these words from your scripture that they will bless us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. If you'd like to respond this morning to the invitation... Please come as we stand and sing.